So these are from last week, Dr. Rob. So does toxic, hey, Tammy. Hi. does toxic masculinity eventually subside as an addict gets deeper and deeper into recovery? I'm so sad I allowed the emotional abuse that my son has had to go through that I just had no idea about it until now. Unfortunately, I'm just not dealing with sex addiction with my essay husband, but also parenting with him is so hard. I hate that part just as much as I hate addiction in him. I, since I don't have it in front of me, there's a lot I of things in there. I can change that. So, I'm going to forward this email to you and oh, you can okay. hopefully, because I, I saved it there. on a screenshot. Yeah. So. Or a text is even better. Um, well, but either way. I, I will see if I can text them, but. I just no, I can do an them. email. I just opened okay. my email. It's all fine. Okay. Go ahead. Let's see what Thanks. Tammy wrote me. So um, that was in the image 6364. Start with that one, please. I have nothing since five o'clock, but hold on a second. Uh, 456. I'm checking for mail now. I'm sending it in your text. Oh, we haven't. Oh, okay. That's faster. I know. Sorry, That's folks. So yeah, we are working on. I just, the truth is, we're working on making sure all your questions get answered, and that's why we're here. Trying okay. our best. Okay, so th the first one, open that, please. Uh, where are you? Uh, uh, after that, second. <laughs> it said it's coming. To send, okay, I so. can see this. Ah. Um, what are the differences between? Oh, okay. Thanks for these questions. I'm wondering if you could speak. No, the, I need it to be the 6364. So check your email, check your text. So does toxic masculinity. I have six, okay, I have 656, 648, and 645. Yeah, those are the second set. But the, I didn't get the first I, set. I just resent it to you and it's in an oh. email. So, so. Oh, I see. There's the other one. <laughs> does toxic masculinity eventually subside? Oh, uh, okay, so I don't know. I can think of all different kinds of things that toxic masculinity means, but to me, it means sort of having to be a man and feeling like uh, um, women are less than you, cruising every woman who walks down the street, seeing women as objects. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't know what it means to you. Perhaps as a woman, you might have some thoughts about that. Um, but the answer is yes, because part of what we do is really, well, what we do, I don't know everyone else, and certainly in 12-step recovery is really, is push humility. I think humility is a really, and it's hard to be in that, you know, I'm a dude place and still have humility. So I think that, I think, I know Tamara would agree that just working on the 12 steps, um, forget uh, therapy and all that, produces a more respectful, humble person if they are committed to the process. Is that I, I I really agree and and yes but and th this person the anonymous attendee says you know as deeper and in, deeper into recovery absolutely but that's the key deeper and deeper into recovery so you know I, I unfortunately today has been a day of talking to a lot of people where the person isn't really doing much you know and change doesn't happen if they're not you know like. I was talking to a, a really, not just Dr. Rob, but a really skilled therapist that I refer lots of people to. And and this person was sharing, it's another doctor um, in the field. And and she was sharing how, you know, uh, uh, you know, clients are, you know, barely doing anything. Well, then they're not seeing any changes and guess what? Then the partner is under distress as well. So, so leaning into, and I agree with Dr. Rob, you know, particularly steps four through nine. That is the meat of the program. That is where we start to make those shifts. You know, we find our humility, but that's not, you know, it, it, we, humility is a clear and accurate portrayal of who we are, understanding who we are. We're not, oh, I'm so horrible or I'm so wonderful. It's like um, uh, being right-sized. That's, yeah, you know, that's right, the goal. Right size. Yeah, so, yeah, so, and and we can learn it and you know we're not going to do it perfectly but the deeper as you say the deeper and deeper into recovery the more that person will show up and the less the unright sized person will show up so okay yeah, wait for I, the next I, one. I wanted Go to ahead. just quickly respond to um i was just talking to a couple that i think every couple and especially spouses when they begin to realize that the neglect the distancing the unavailability you know, it's very hard to look at your kids and say that they were affected by this and they were, you know, there's not much you can really do about that. So, but it is painful. 
and you do have to co-parent. Um, and again, also I say, if there's humility about being a parent, um, you know, and always being a student, I think that that can be fixed um, over time. So the next question is from the 645. First of all, thank you for all these great Q and A's. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the processes in the brain and behavioral process addictions. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, so the reason we call them process addictions is because someone isn't addicted to the, uh, the sex. They're not addicted to the gambling. Those are the endpoints like a carrot that drive them forward. People who are process addicted, they are literally addicted to the whole process, to the fantasy, to the thinking, to the looking, to the getting ready, to the carrying out. The good news, by the way, is that if you look at the whole process, the shortest piece is the acting out, which gives clients or people, I'm thinking of our clients now, gives people a lot of opportunities to say, oh, I'm in this fantasy. What do I do? Oh, I'm driving by this house. What do I do? So the longer time they have is a good thing. But um, but people who are in process addictions, they, are, uh, they lose themselves before they've even, actually, I would say that all addicts, um, what do I want to say? Uh, all addicts have the same brain process going on with us, which is we use a very primitive part of our brain and fantasy to tolerate things that have been intolerable when we were younger and are still emotionally intolerable now. And whether you turn to alcohol or drugs or gambling or gaming or food or sex, the process in the brain of the excitement, the intensity, the adrenaline, the endorphins, what's happening in the brain is very, very similar. Um, it's just that with a drug addict, you have an ongoing experience after you do the whole process. And with the process addiction, addicted people, it's like it ends when the sex is over. It ends when you run out of money. But the brain, the brain doesn't see it as any different. It is an escapist uh, neurobiological process that under stress escalates and requires a lifetime of awareness. Um, so I do think it's a brain problem um, for sure. And it comes about because our brains really don't form in the way they should when we're very, very young. And our, our neurons and the way our brain is linking up and growing um, does that in relationship to challenging upbringing. And so we look at the world differently than healthy people do. Um, and that's a lifelong challenge because of the way the brain evolved. Um, yeah, Tammy, you want to answer that? Uh, the only thing the I, I, like you, you, um, you, you know, you adapted it to any form of addiction because and I really do whether it's chemical or any form of behavioral it, it still is doing the same thing for us you know I, I often say alcoholism isn't because alcohol tastes so great it's because it's taking us away and escaping from everything else just like you know every, like sex porn eating whatever you know well gaming. it's the same with us I mean so many sex addicts will walk into a situation and they'll have sex with someone they're not attracted to oh they'll have sex experience they don't feel safe but they've already gotten so excited emotionally about it that that it's like a, a rock rolling downhill they just sort of end up going for it uh, whether they feel good about it or not so the next one is, uh, my question is two parts. What are the differences in behaviors between a porn addict who's stressed but sober, a one and a half plus years of active recovery, CSAT and 12 step, et cetera, and a porn addict who has relapsed? Are they similar? Hmm. Can you, before we come on the next one, do you wanna to speak to that, Tammy? I'm, I'm still not quite sure I, well, I understand, I, but I, I want to. So here's what I'm reading into this. To me, this is, you know, is someone who is in active recovery, who, who really is, who's working a program, has a 12-step CSAT, et cetera, right. if they're stressed, will they look like a porn addict who has relapsed? And to me, I would say no. But, um, you know, there would be, um, I could see well, how having a short fuse or, you know, having to make amends for something, you know, but, but. Um, but if somebody is is going offline and self-soothing with a relapse, that to me would look different than somebody who's going, I need to go call my sponsor. Like, I'm really stressed out. I need to go do self-care. I need to go do program. I need to do something different. So I would assume that you would see a difference. Do you, I, maybe you have different thoughts. No, I fully agree, Tammy. In fact, I would take it a step further, which is uh, I think someone who is in recovery will tell you. I'm struggling, I had a slip, I'm having a hard time. I know I look a little different today, that's because. So one of the things I think um, 
between someone who's stressed but sober versus someone who's relapsed is how they communicate with you and how honest, how how they appear to be. Someone who's out of slip should say, listen, you know, I really need to tell you this. It's going to be a bad evening, but I'm struggling with this. I'm working on it. Someone who is acting out and in relapse may not ever tell you. And I think that is the difference. Um, uh, pro so pro-dependence doesn't mean to put up with everything that you're dealing with. I haven't read um, that part yet. Do you want me to read oh, it? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had no, no, no. Go ahead. No, no, no. So the second part is how can I, as a spouse, practice prodependence in both scenarios? What if I'm unsure, but he's denying a relapse? So prodependence looks at these issues a little differently. Prodependence simply says, you have made a decision to be with this person because you love them and you want things to work out and you care about them. You're not in this situation because your mother did this and your father did that and you have to explore your history and figure out why you're with them and how you're with them. And we're just not interested in that part. We're interested in how um, how loyal you've been, how committed you've been and how hurt you've been as a result of that. Um, so to me, um, I can love someone but not trust them. I can love someone and say, I don't, I don't, Think you're sober and I feel um, I can choose to stay with them, you know, because that would be very loving or maybe the most loving thing I can do is set a boundary and take care of myself. Prodependence is about not blaming myself and not taking responsibility and not having to examine myself when someone else I care about screws up. Now, it doesn't mean I stay in an unsafe situation. It doesn't mean that I move, you know, uh, it doesn't mean I'll always know when a healthy situation is there, but I, I, absolutely cannot take responsibility or blame myself for someone else's behavior. And the only reason I'm here is because I love them and I care about them and I have hope. And that could happen in either scenario. So, uh, Tammy, do you have a different answer or something that might help with that? Now, I, I, I always go to trust your gut. I mean, like what an addict says, unfortunately, particularly, you know, if they're if they have relapsed, if they're not on a recovery path is not trustworthy, what their actions are doing, what they're doing. You know, if he's, I'm saying he um, is struggling, then what, oh yeah, he says he's denying it. So if he is struggling, then it's, you lean into more help. You see your CSAT twice a week. You call your sponsor every day. You are doing our drop-in groups that are free. He, hopefully he's here on this you know, webinar tonight. So um, if you are not seeing, you know, uh, more, more, and I've shared this before in a webinar, COVID was horrible for me. Guess what? I did more 12 step. I did more of my recovery program. I had to, you know, that was how, like, I took care of myself and made sure I wasn't having to make amends all over the place. It was like, I needed to lean into my recovery. So if I'm stressed, I lean like, I don't have time not to do my recovery program. I have to make that a priority. I can't set it aside and go, oh, I'm busy. I'm stressed. You know, you know, work as much as I love this work. Like, I still need to take care of myself, you know. So um, so that to me would be, yeah. But, but no, that's really key, though, is like, you know. So, and as far as prodependence, unfortunately, there's a perception out there is prodependence is you stay with your spouse, you know, and love them no matter what. And uh, Dr. Rob's explanation was was really key. Um, so please hear that. It's the lens at which you, you know, we're looking at partners. We're not pathologizing going, you're an enabler, you're codependent, you're part of the problem. You love somebody who's struggling, but that does not mean you sacrifice yourself. And I want to add to that because um, I just revised the, well, my publisher and I revised the original Prodependence, which was, which was written in 2018. And here we are, 2022. You're pointing at the sky, Tammy, but we appreciate it. Thank you. It has the word myth in it. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I revised it, well, there's two. One is that there's an academic version that came out for therapists and, and it it really tells them how to do this work. Thank you, Tammy. Um, do you have the Wizard of Oz, Andy? No. Um <laughs> Okay, so um, once I'd written the book for professionals, I realized that there were some parts missing to the original book. And one of the pieces was missing that I've heard people say is, well, does this mean I just need to stay around where there's abuse? So the new book has a whole chapter on how to deal with abuse and what is abuse and what is codependence and relationship to abuse and, you know, and calling out what you do if you're being, you know, all of that kind of stuff, because it really wasn't well written in the first book. So uh, it is in the new book, but in answer to your question, um, Parent dependence is not about staying around for any kind of harm. It's more about loving yourself for having stayed. That, that's really what it's about.
Well said. I like that. I'll remember that one. Thank you. I, okay. I might have write that down sometime. I, I know. Okay. So um, we have one more question from last I week. See it. Does recovery take a longer period of time depending on the length of time that someone has been acting out? I, you know what? My Great automatic question. rant. Yeah. So here, recovery is a lifelong journey. So my, and this does not, I don't want this to sound snarky at all, but my, my answer is um, if you spent more time acting out, you have less time to be on a recovery path. So I don't know, like, but, but does, so I, I suspect the question is, does it, is it harder to get into a solid recovery program if you've been doing the acting out longer? And I honestly don't know. I see a lot of people that have been doing it for decades and they do really well. I think it really is more about what are you willing to do and how committed you are to your recovery program. You know, if you, if you've only been acting out, let's pretend for, you know, three years, but you are only going to maybe see a therapist once in a while. And I'm not really going to go to those meetings because I don't like them. Guess what? You're not going to change. If you've been acting out for decades and you go, I really need to change and I want to do that. And you lean into your recovery program. It's transformative. So thoughts. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because I was talking to a gentleman today who was in his sixties about joining us at seeking integrity for treatment. And he should, in my opinion. Um, and what we're talking about was, you know, I mean, it's just what Tammy said, which I really appreciated. I mean, one is motivation. And whether I'm 25 or 55, I can I will get further with being committed to the to the change and doing whatever I can to make a change, no matter how old I am. Um, and what she said is also true, which is, you know, I was fortunate enough to enter the rooms of recovery at 26. And I'm now a lot older than that. <laughs> and so I have had the advantage of having gotten some recovery early on then going to therapy for many, many years and staying in. So I have a lot more information, a lot more insight, a lot more self-awareness, right, Tammy? Then, mm -hmm. then does someone who walks in, now the gentleman I was talking to today is 60 something. Yes, he can get recovery. Yes, he can grow. But um, emotional growth as a human being, becoming more compassionate, more empathic, more, uh, more reflective, more, more humble, that takes more time. You know, that takes more time in 12 step that takes more time, meaning I can stop the acting out if I really am focused and I do the right things, but becoming a better person that takes longer. And so, you know, depending on how troubled that person is, and you have to understand, like, we're not just broken in this area, we're broken in every area, you know, we're not the, we don't have our shit together in our brains. And so some people may latch on to recovery and very quickly get through that process and start to grow other people it can take years before they just get the recovery part down so in some ways it really is individual um, but i will say that someone who's older doesn't have the luxury of time to say well i'm going to work on this for 20 years one of the reasons that I'll, i make a number of referrals to seeking integrity is because someone says well i want to start therapy and this and that but they're 64 years old and you know it's like well i understand that but how much time do you have to be in therapy, you know, and how long do you want to start? One of the reasons I recommend someone comes for three, four weeks is get a head start, you know, do some of the work you haven't been able to do and then launch into what your life will be about. And I will say also just to say it, that we do really great treatment, but that's not where the rubber hits the road. It's when they go, when you go home, what are you doing with the work that you learned about? How committed are you over the long term? We can lay out a path, but, whether people are going to follow it or not is up to them. So. Yes, but but they have a a really good plan. They have the, and path. the Yeah, well, and and the support to be successful. So it absolutely is. You know, I, unfortunately, I've heard of people that have been in treatment and then they go home and they're resting from their treatment experience. And I was like, that is a really poor choice. You know. So well, actually, but, if we're going to go there, we have clients who come to treatment and they say, well. You know, what I've planned when I get out is to go for a vacation in Bahamas for at least three weeks because treatment will have been hard. And I'm like, well, actually, you need to go home and start going to meetings and go to see a yeah. therapist. And um, treatment is not something you have to get a vacation from after. It's something you have to get to work on after. Yes, but anyway, yes. let's keep going. We got lots okay, of questions. Okay, so now we've got, so, and you should, can you, can you see all it. of them? Okay, I'm here. so it starts with 601. Can you see that one? I'm starting early. Hi, Tammy. Grateful. Can you see that one? I no, you can't. Five. I no, have, well, gonna... We're on a different time zone. So I have six for your time, 607, 618, okay. and 621. 
I just put it in the, so this 01, I'm starting early. Hi, Tammy, grateful for all you do. My question, SA husband has disclosed exhibitionist behaviors, exposing himself in public parks for a couple of decades, two to three times per month. Is this type of paraphilia treatable? How does a couple work through this? I am shocked and not sure how to take this new information. I, I hear you. So. Um, and I feel for you because, yeah. and you haven't used this word, but your husband's a sex offender. I mean, when you show people things that they didn't ask to see and you don't have their consent, consent is how you define offending. Now he's a low level offender. This isn't someone who's putting their hands on someone, but they will and can get arrested for their behavior because it's not legal. And it's not consensual, so it is an offending behavior. Um, and sadly, in my experience, this is one of the most difficult to treat. It is so deeply embedded in these per people's both exhibition and voyeurism are probably, I don't know what Tamara would say, but I think they're two of the most difficult compulsive sexual behaviors to, to manage. Because in some ways, it's part of what turns the person on, period. It's not just something that's fun for them to do occasionally. It's like some people are into leather, some people are into lace, some people, you know, those are fetishes. For them, it's um, an arousal process. It's not just, um, I'm going to say this, it's not just something they do, like I see sex workers, but now in recovery, I don't, or I look at porn, and now I don't. It's part of what turns them on. Um, and so eliminating that is harder because it it is a primary part of their arousal of what arouses them. So they may stop that behavior, but that particular behavior will still be arousing to them. And that makes it harder to stop. So yes, absolutely, it is treatable, but it is never cured. It is never fixed. And it requires, I think, a very consistent attention, very consistent. This is someone who needs to check in every day. You know, I, I have to tell you an exhibitionism story, Tammy. This is not amusing, but it was the right thing to do. Do you remember Elizabeth Griffin? Yes. She told me this story. So um, I worked in the, well, she, my colleague of mine worked with an offender who was an exhibitionist and he'd been arrested once. And what he would do is he'd go into the park and go jogging and he wouldn't wear underwear or whatever it was. And that wasn't good for him. And it was very compulsive. So we had an agreement. And that agreement was if he found himself, because sometimes addicts wake up and they're like, oh, I'm about to do the wrong thing. If he found himself with the wrong clothes on in his car. This is true. He had to get out of his car, park it on the side of the road and take his keys and throw them in the sewer. Because then he couldn't get to the park and then he couldn't go. And then he had something he had to deal with. And you know, that may sound like, the town may just look like, really? Well, yeah, I gotta I tell like, you, wow. it kept him out of the park in his underwear. So if he had to lose some keys or take a couple hours calling a AAA or whatever, it was better for him and he did it. Because, you know, it's better than getting arrested. It's better than destroying your all, all, whole life. It's better than victimizing other people. So the lengths to which someone who is committed to change will go can be, a, you know, how do I say this? Can be more extreme and more surprising than you might think. But this is what motivation is. That man was not going to go and do that again. And he agreed that this is what he was going to do come hell or high water. And that is what he did. And therefore he, and by the way, once you throw your keys in the store a couple of times, it really dis discourages you from con continuing to go and do this. Because once you've dealt with that a few times, you don't want to call AAA one more time. So yeah. Um, yeah. Tammy, do you have thoughts about this as well? well? Well, I do. So I want to go back to the, you know, I'm, I am shocked. Um, and, and I can imagine that I, I hope he takes this seriously. I hope you do as well, but I hope he does because like Dr. Rob is right. This is arrestable. This is makes the news. If you have children, guess what? You know, like, I mean, it, like it's just, it, there, it, it needs to be attended to. So um, if you need resources, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Um, I'll do my best to help you find the right help and support. By the way, okay. I, I would add to that because Tammy touched on something that I thought was so important. I would say to this person, you know, sex addict husband, a sex offender husband, by the way, I would say, I just want you to realize what this is going to cost us. You know, if people catch you in the neighborhood, no one is going to ever bring their kids over to our house. You know, um, you will probably, if you get arrested, you're probably going to lose your job. You know, um, if it's with a neighbor, how are we ever going to live there again? I've had people had to move because of, they were doing things in the neighborhood, looking in windows, whatever. And once they were found out, they couldn't live there anymore. So 
part, I think, of healing is to take a good look at what the reality of your consequences might be. And I think you're thinking about, do I want to leave me and my kids in a situation, if you have kids where this might happen, you know, you might set some boundaries that say, if this happens, I need to do this for myself and my family. I, if the police are going to come knocking, I don't want to be here when they answer, you know? And so this needs a lot of boundaries, a lot of structure, because it is so compulsive. Um, yeah, good question. And I just had this other thought, Dr. Robin, um, but like, if this is what he's told you, I, you know, I have concern that there's more because addicts only fess up with certain things. So, so I want you to hear me clearly get support for you. I'm glad you're here, but get support for oh. you. Thoughts? Tammy, can you put in safersociety.org? They're an organization for people who are in, who are, are are in a primary relationship within a sex offender. This could be an offender who's your child, an offender who's your husband, an offender who's your wife. And they also talk about, you know, the resources for offender, both of the offenders and the legal system. It's just a, a really wonderful nonprofit. It's been around a long time. And you can probably get some information about what is a spouse to do in this circumstance? Or is there a group I can go to in that, you know, something like that. I, a safer society is wonderful. I would encourage it. Um, there's also a group called ATSA, A-T-S-A, the, uh, Tammy, what is ATSA? No, it's not ATSA. It's, what is the offender one? Um, I think it is. Um, uh, it is ATSA. Yeah, yeah. for sex, offend, uh, sex uh, I, I'll look it up. ATSA. Yeah, I, I'll look it up. So, right. These are organizations yeah. that are meant for people who treat offenders, involved with offenders, um, you know, um, the, the uh, legal system, you know, these are resources. And they're not easy to find. So I think uh, check them out, see what you what you see there. Okay. So the next question, and I will look up the ATSA stuff because I think here it is. So is it possible to work 12 step for substance and sex at the same time? Should one work um, before the other? Is it okay to have two different sponsors for each issue? Well, I want to say one thing about that. And then I'm going to talk it back to Tammy, which is, um, there's a simple answer to this, but it's not a simple answer. The, the, the first answer that comes to my mind, and this is how we do things in order, is if you are drinking and using, you're never going to be able to have sobriety in a behavior. Because once I'm a little, in, once I've had a couple of drinks or a little bit of this or that, suddenly it doesn't seem like such a big deal to go do this. And all of my commitments and boundaries, and they all get a little blurry because I'm a little loaded. And so when people are using, it's near impossible to deal with a behavior or process addiction. Now, there are some people where they're paired. I mean, this is what we do in treatment. We actually, one of the populations we treat is people who are, I mean, that we treat specifically are people who combine drugs and sex. There are lots of things to be said about that, um, meaning we'll, they come from different places. They can be acted out in different ways. For example, I might every I just talked to someone who did this. Every time I drink, I act out. Then I know other people, they go see sex workers and that's where the drugs are or that's where the alcohol is. So it can work forwards and back, backwards and forwards, yes, but the substance has to be dealt with primarily. But I'll tell you what, if I was acting out sexually and I hated myself, I might keep drinking. So yes, I do think you can go to AA and you can go to SAA. And you can work the steps with different people. Or maybe in one group, you say, I have a sponsor. In the other group, it's like, I'm going to meet with a couple of guys every week. When, you know, There are different ways to do it. But yeah, you need to have personal involvement in both programs with people that you've gotten to know and who are going to support you. Um, what do you think, Tammy? It's a good question for you. It is. And I love when people do a three-circle plan across all forms that they're acting out. And so they have so they have all of it on the radar. I think it's really important. You know, what, what, are, what are my triggers for, you know, for using substances? What are my triggers for sex? And like Dr. Rob said, you know, forwards or backwards paired, however it is. What is the healthy stuff for me to do? Um, I think it's important to have a person that really knows you. Um, so if you, if you are, I, I really like this idea of having one primary sponsor who gets it and lots of people in the in the 12 steps are more than one addicted in fact I, I you know I've had this before where um I pulled out my big book because I was you know I can be that way but but you know somebody was like they their spouse like going to AA because they didn't really want to do the S group stuff and I said if he did a four step the four step talks about our sexual behaviors it was written in AA 
you know, mm -hmm. I'm not telling secrets. Bill W had a huge issue with, you know, his sexual acting out. So it's one of those things where it has to be addressed across all forms of our problematic behavior, whatever that is. I mentioned earlier, gaming, food, you gambling, whatever it is, you know, if we're going, well, I'm going to hang on to this one. We're a non-smoke, non-vape facility. There's a reason because that keeps that dopamine, you know, going. We, you know, uh, Dr. David talks about it. I think you're nine times more likely to relapse on anything if you're doing that type of stuff. So we want to give everybody the best chance at recovery. So, so I agree, you, you know, going to an S group while you're drunk, you know, would not make sense. So, so there has to be some sort of, you know, commitment with that. And it and it's hard to stop, you know, all the behaviors, but but the reward for doing it and getting the support, if if you have enough support, you can you can be successful across, you know, all the problematic behaviors. And that's really where, you know, we become happy, joyous, and free. It's a 12-step thing. Happy, joyous, and free is when we're not just switching to another form of problematic behavior. Ready for the next one? Yes, Hi there. My first time here, and I'm so thankful for all you do to help those with SA and their partners. My SA husband and I are 11 months out from discovery and nine months out from therapeutic disclosure. We're both seeing CSETs, and we feel we're doing well in our journey of healing and recovery. That's fantastic. However, sometimes I get flooded with feelings. So this is from the betrayed partner. This is too good to be true. I mean, this in regard to how well my partner's recovery is going. I feel this is a trauma response in me because I have no suspicions prior to discovery, but I feel hurt that this doubt makes it hard to embrace the progress in our lives. How do I address this feeling that this is too good to be true? Thanks in advance. Tammy, what are your Well, it, it's challenging. So, so first of all, um, I, like I hate to take away any of the, you know, the lovely feelings, um, but this is a journey and this is like, there's, so uh, a couple of years ago, I hiked the Grand Canyon. There's a point to this, but um, um, but I took this picture of the of the journey. Like I was up by that point, and it's it's a beautiful vista path. But that was a hard, hard, hard hike. And I thought, and I used I wrote a blog about th this is the analogy for my recovery journey is. You know, yes, I have these moments where it's just like amazing. But the other aspect of it for me in my blog was there's always been people along the way. So one of the things, um, and I I don't want you to shame or or take you know, uh, the, take the hurt on for you, but um, but like usually partners, you know, are about eighteen months behind or twelve to eighteen months behind you know, on the, on the recovery journey. So what I hear is somebody who at 11 months from discovery, nine months from, um, from formal therapeutic disclosure is, is in a kind of a pink cloud. We call that in recovery. So, right. so I, I, I think um, journaling is what comes to mind for me is like journal and journal what you really are, not overthink it, just journal and see what comes out of that. Share that in a support. We have the drop-in groups on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. Hopefully you're working, you know, yeah, you say we're both seeing your CSATs. I would take that to the CSAT. So enjoy, you know, some of that, but also don't trust, uh, he, like he's already shown you that he isn't 100% trustworthy. So you'll never be able to quite as naively, and that's not a bad thing, you know, trust, but you can have a better, deeper, more open relationship. So that's, a, so, so it's great, but be a little cautious. And I really encourage you to, you know, to, to, uh, you know, do journaling is so huge because you, you just what you pour out, you know, can be truer than what your brain lets you think about. Well, um, I, I, I always think about what it's, very, very useful to reflect in journal. Tammy, I have journals going back to 1985 when I first entered the program. I actually have notes. Went to my first meeting. Don't like wow. it. will never come back. Like I have that, I swear to God. And Thank I have another God one. You didn't listen to yourself. <laughs> I have another one that says, you know, this is 1986. You know, I really think that something that's really needed is a program to help people with this. And if I ever get to that point, I'd like to start one. And that was all, isn't that amazing? Oh, I mean, wow. I can't believe I, anyway, I'll send it to you sometime. It makes me yeah. cry. 
Um, so I want to I want to back up to what Tammy said, which is regardless of how your spouse is doing, you've been violated, you've been perpetrated, you are a victim, and nobody likes to be a victim, but you've been victimized by the lying, by the secrets, by the acting out. And so just because your partner's doing well for the last nine months didn't mean they well, sorry, they still lied to you for 12 years. They still cheated on you, they still hurt you. And so the idea, and and you'll never look at them in the same way. You know, I often say this, which is there is a naive sense in a good way that when you commit to someone in a marriage or committed, that that they would never deliberately go out in the world and do something to hurt you. What I want to believe about the people that I love is when they go out in the world, they always have my back. And they would never do anything that they know would hurt me. Well, now you know that this person you're loved, who you're committed to, and however long you've been together, they can go out in the world and without thinking, go do things that they know will hurt you and then come back and pretend that they didn't happen. So I can get sober in nine months, but I bet this person has a whole lot of work to do on who they are and how, I mean, the work doesn't end with stopping that behavior. It starts with stopping the behavior. So whoever, this partner has a lot more work to do. And just because they're going to things and they have some time sober, that doesn't mean they don't have a whole lot of work ahead of them. And in, in mirroring that, it's way too early for you to, in fact, I think you're doing really well. Um, I have spouses who say, you know, I'm angry every single day and I'm never going to, you know, you've all, it's only been nine months. You know, it's 11 months since you found out. It hasn't even been a year. One of the things I write about in Out of the Doghouse about the men is they all think it should be over in six weeks or why are you still angry at me? It's been nine months or it could be a year and a half. You know, it's going to take time. And I think the best thing you can do is be really patient with yourself. I also didn't see anything, Tammy, two things about going to any of the partners groups. Because no, I think so working with sit, a CSAT, yeah. Which is great. But we offer 19 groups a week with with nothing but therapists who volunteer their time, and a number of them are for spouses. And I say to spouses all the time, if you don't want to be seen, you know, cover your camera. If you don't want to be heard, you can mute yourself. But just listen to the wisdom of those people and the anger who are working on it, because it's 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 what I hear you doing is comparing your recovery to his recovery. Or and I would rather you looked at yourself in terms of the other people who are going through what you're going through. Because for you to go to a support group and for someone to say it's been a year and a half and I freaking hate them, it'll make you feel better that you're not alone. Or it's been three years, but I all of a sudden I'm thinking about that again. It it's a trauma. It's a trauma, and trauma doesn't just disappear or get better because that incident has is not happening anymore. It sits in your body and your soul and your brain. So all I can say to you is I think you should be really more compassionate with yourself and kinder with yourself. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I would hate it if the addict in your life is saying anything like, when are you going to go over this? Or you seem angry all the time. Or, you know, it's or not look theirs. how good I'm doing. I hear right. that one all the time. Yeah, yeah, look how well I'm doing. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, Tammy, do we do we still do or when do we do our trade partners group? Because to me, this is a perfect situation for someone to go to that that educational support group. It'll start again in January. It's a six a six week long live facilitated. So these are not just watching videos. Uh, work group. Uh, Angela Spearman does a great job. It's from a pro-dependent lens. Um, they are via Zoom. They're low cost, $350 for the entire six-week course. So um, that would be great. And if he hasn't already done like Sex Addiction 101, that or would out be- of the dog house. Uh, or Out of the Doghouse would be a really good one. Mm -hmm. We have the Inner Child um, that will start again after the first of the year, the um, Attachment Wounds. Uh, we've got so many great work groups on SeekingIntegrity.com to support the journey, not just the, oh my gosh, you know, it's it's a challenge, which is what sex addiction 101 or porn addiction 101 is, but, um, but the ongoing, you know, recovery process and journey. And, and, you know, when Tammy says through a pro-dependent lens, that means when we're working with partners, we don't say, what did you do that you could have done differently? Or I say to spouses all the time, and those of you who want to write this down, it's worth writing down. Um, there's nothing that I have ever done. There's nothing I've ever done. There's nothing that I'm doing now. And there's nothing I could ever do to make someone else act out, whether it's drinking, using, sexing. There's nothing I've ever done. There's nothing I'm doing now. And there's nothing I could ever do 
to make someone else act out. If you and I are fighting and I think you're fat and ugly and mean, you don't want to have sex with me, I can divorce you. I can leave you. I can go, you know, bike riding. But the decision to go have sex with another person or have an affair because I'm unhappy in my relationship is mine. There is nothing that you can do to make that happen ever, ever, to period, the end. So when we're talking about betrayed partners groups, it's about things like setting good boundaries for yourself and how to figure out sexuality and should you and shouldn't you and when and how and what to do with your anger and how to grieve this kind of, you know, it's about that, but it's never to say what's wrong with you that you ended up with this situation. That's not how we look at it. So just want to say that. Thanks, Tammy. That was great. Okay. So the next one, I am a 62 year old. My mother was bless her heart as she died three weeks ago. Quite crazy. I started with um, MB addiction. What's MB addiction? Mar addiction at five, at five year, years. Masturbation. Old. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Thank you. It started PA um, porn addiction at about seven years old, married 30, 40 years, but have not shared bedroom with my wife for 32 years. No sex, wow. no relationship. I'm about a hundred days sober for the first time in my life. 57 years of trying to quit these addictions with no success until these hundred days. Wife does not know about the addictions. No DDA spiritual advisor convinced me that I can stop and that I better take stopping seriously. No disclosure. Of course, listen to Tammy and took the 12 steps to the step of making amends, no therapy, no 12 step support program, just going on on my own. How can I make amends to my wife when she doesn't even know about my problems? It is my hope that with sobriety, I can start to grow up emotionally and you can from the five-year-old emotional state that I probably at. Maybe with permanent sobriety, I can grow up and actually build a relationship. Yes. Do you think this is possible? Yes. Or am I off? Base? Permanent. The watch out for that word permanent. Yeah. Well, that's all I have is today. So yes, a daily reprieve, but you got a hundred days so there, of daily. Reprieve. There is no permanent sobriety. There is a commitment. There's a, there's a, I'm sorry. I mean to correct you. It's just, no, I, I don't want anyone not. to think that it. you can do this yeah. and be done. Mm -hmm. um, there can be a permanent commitment. There can be a permanent effort, but the actual outcome you know, we cannot predict that the whole one day at a time thing really is I am sober today. And I can't worry about next week and last week is over. So can you get through today um, without acting out? That's as much and after all these years, that's as much as I expect from myself. I never know when someone's going to walk up and I, you know, but I can get through this day. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer this because um, let me just look for a second. Um, do you see anything about it? Okay, no therapy, no trial. I was going to say, don't do own. disclosure. So really. you're like, asking the wrong yeah. question, yeah. which is you're asking about, I don't know, I want to think of a good way of saying this. I love metaphors. It's like your 16 year old saying, you know, I want to drive across the country in your car, but I've never had a driving lesson. You know, do you think I can make it to New York from California? you need to learn and then you need to follow the rules and then you need to know how to follow them. And then you need other people to, there is such a long process you move to, you're like five steps ahead when you haven't done two, three, and four. And I'm not talking about the 12 steps. I'm thinking about, you're asking about, I don't know how to say it. it there is, unless you do this work that's ahead of you, therapy, if you can afford it, whatever, certainly 12 step, we have a lot of free groups, you know, as Tammy said, we have a sex addiction 101, a porn addiction 101. There are a lot of things you can do. Um, but if you're not active in this process, then you're just dumping. First of all, your wife's going to find out. At some point, she's going to find out. Number two, you're going to have no support for any of that, whether she finds out or whatever, because you have no support. We cannot do this alone. Um, none of us. You might get a year. You might get six months. You might, but this is what you're doing is what we call white knuckling which is you're grabbing onto the table and you're saying, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. And everything about recovery is letting go. It's about saying, I, I could do this anytime and I have to be committed to something in order to not. And it's not, I'm not going to be able to do it alone and I'm going to need a lot of support. So the very things that keep you sober permanently, you're not doing. And so why would you ever want to go to your spouse? By the way, she might say, oh, what are you doing for support? What are you going to say then? Oh, I've just got this. You know, so you're, I think you got the cart ahead of the horse. You're not ready yourself to tell anyone anything because you don't have the, the, the foundation underneath you to manage that if, and when you do. Um, so I don't think that, uh, 
you cannot make amends to someone when they don't know about the, about the problems. Um, besides, the whole thing about spiritual is something else. No deed, no disclosure. Spiritual, spirit, a spiritual advisor convinced me that I can stop and I better take stopping seriously. Okay, if you're going to take stopping seriously, go to 12-step meetings go to educational groups like the ones we have, go to support groups, get a therapist. If you are taking this seriously, seriously is not, mm, I'm going to try harder. No, no, I'm going to try, try harder. Oh, by the way, can I do my try thing, Tammy? Let's see if I can do this. Okay. Can you tell me to try to, to, to drop the, go ahead. Try to drop that. Try really hard. Okay. I'm try really, really, try. really, really hard. I, I am it. trying my best. You're, you're not making it. So. Now, well, it's stuck to my hand. Now, what do I do? <laughs> Try harder. I did. I tried as hard as I can. If I was there, I'd take it out of your hand because I would help you. I would help you. So the next step is drop it. Mm -hmm. And notice that there was movement. There was action. There wasn't any thinking and there wasn't any trying. There was actually doing. And I see a lot more thinking than I do doing. And by the way, if your wife ever finds out, she's going to want to know what group do you go to? What are you doing about this? How are you handling this? You know? And by the way, yeah. So I could talk and talk forever, but I will say that I don't think you're keeping your side of the street clean enough to take any step toward her. Um, yeah. So I put the Sex Addiction 101 Love of One work group. It starts December 5th. That's on the Seeking Integrity site. And this I is a porn addict. There. So we also have a porn addiction. Oh, one, right? yeah. So we do have a porn addiction one. So I didn't put that, but it's on the same link. And then you know okay. what? I, you said it. You're, you know, you're emotionally a five year old. Like it's a process of growing up, you know, and you can't, you know, you can't go from five to writing your college thesis in, you know, in 100 days. So well, it I is a process. <laughs> it, it is a process and you need support. You need teachers. Like you, when you went to school and you had teachers teach you how to do stuff, that's what peer groups are. That's what a qualified professional is. You know, the, the, an addiction is a mental health condition. You know, it is, it is, this is not just a choice or using the spiritual stuff. It's not just sin. It is like, we have our brain thinks different. My brain still thinks different. And I've been doing this recovery thing for a while and but i know how to interrupt that i know when i'm going oh that's not really a great choice but i've learned but you know what i had to be taught i had to have help you know to do that i don't know anybody who successfully has you know white knuckled it for any kind of long period of time with any kind of quality of life that's the other thing like i've seen very miserable people who were abstinent that's it they were abstinent they were not living in recovery so um, uh, I did put one, one more thing, it, it, guys who want help, you know, we have a, pro, you know, the, we have a program who at Seeking Integrity is 14, 21 or 28 day length of stay. We help with all of the issues that you're struggling with. And you know, we have support for partners um, from a pro-dependent lens. So what do we got? Okay, the next one. In early recovery, how do I know if my essay husband is no longer acting out and isn't just hiding it better? I've seen him making a huge change, changing his phone number, deleting social media, stopping the use of marijuana, listening to your podcast, et cetera. And he goes to, um, two, to four. Uh, to two to four or 12 step meetings per week and is seeing a CSAT weekly. But I still find signs of acting out here and there, lying, hiding money, talking with coworkers about nude photos of women mm -hmm. they both know. And oh, yeah, both of new photos of women they know, and sh that shatters me every time. Mm. Okay, well, let me make this very clear. Your husband is still acting out. You don't have to wait and find out. Somebody who's hiding money, chatting up coworkers that they've shared nude photos with, or or talking to other coworkers about nude photos of women they both know. First of all, you should be shattered. I would be shattered because you're getting you're getting gaslighted. He, someone is telling you, oh, no, I'm in recovery and I'm really doing well. It's just these little things. That is addiction. You know, who, think about it, who lies, hides money and chats up their coworkers about nude pictures that, I mean, forget me too and all of that. Like, why would anyone be doing that? Why would a 35, 50 year old man be sitting around looking at porn with their coworkers? 
So to me, this would not be the kind of sobriety that I would want. And Tammy talked about circle plans, which is something we do in the courses and in treatment where you really sit down and look at what is my bottom line that is absolutely unacceptable to me. Because remember, this is like an eating disorder. We don't want someone to never eat again. We want to define what is healthy for them. And in our arena, we want to define what is healthy sex. We don't want them to eliminate sex. But there is no way in God's earth that sharing nude photos and lying and hiding money would ever be a part of my recovery. So I agree, I'd be shattered and upset but not just about that part, I'd be shattered and upset about the whole thing. Like, how can this person say they're not acting out when they're doing these things? Um, it doesn't make any sense. Now, maybe he's convinced himself that he's not acting out, but you came here and you asked this question and it makes sense to me that you don't feel entirely safe. I'm glad he deleted the phone numbers. I'm glad he deleted the social media. I'm glad he stopped getting high. I'm glad he's listening to my podcast. It's pretty good. Um, I'm glad that he's going to 12-step meetings and he's seeing a CSAT. That's all terrific, but he's still acting out. Um, just the fact that he's doing something that horrifies you and makes you feel awful, um, that's enough, you know? Um, but this is icky and uncomfortable. By the way, I don't know if it's true or not because we never, re we never really know, but he's seeing a CSAT. Is he telling the CSAT that he's looking at these images that he's chatting up sex workers that is because you know we always oh i have a csat i'm going to meetings yeah but what are you telling them you know i have so many guys tammy says this who come back and say well my therapist said well yeah but what did you say to them or is that really what they said because addicts love and they lie to manipulate us and therapy us poor therapists well my therapist said or i told my therapist oftentimes we did none of, the, none of that but you well you're oh i guess if your therapist said it so um I would not feel comfortable with this situation at all. And I'm so glad you're here asking questions. And I can just hear the other spouse's uh, frustration all the way through over here from thinking how they would have to deal with this and how angry they are that you've been talked into this being recovery. So I feel yeah. badly for you. I'm a little angry at him. That's my take. Well, I do too. Because I was like, I, I am 100% confident he's not going to see that and going, yeah. And, you know, I was looking at nude photos of coworkers that I know. I mean, right. like, <laughs> um, and my wife is really upset with it. Do you think she should be? You know? Yeah, no. Okay. So I don't you know what I'll he is. I'm sorry. Right. You know what but, he, you know what your spouse is saying to a CSAT? I guarantee it. Uh, I don't know if this is a woman. Yeah. I think this is a woman talking about her husband. You know, she nags me all the time. And it's like, what I'm doing is never enough. Now, I, you know, whatever I say, she's still angry. She's upset. You know, I, I, the stuff I have, I mean, I, in other words, I can imagine that, that what is coming back about you is stuff that's being said that isn't true to the therapist. It's so easy for us to complain. And our therapist, listen, oh, you poor person. We're mm -hmm. lying. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry. I want you to okay. come and just say that word that's coming next. Just say the word. I was going to say, I'm going to cato chronophilia associated with exhibitionism. Right. So that is something we learned in sex school. That's why I have a PhD in human sexuality. Then why didn't you say it? You should have I will, but it. I want, I can't <laughs> say it. I don't know how to say it. I just know what it means. Top it's people who are yeah. self-arousing in front of mirrors. Oh, so it's someone okay. who is engaged enough with their own image and aroused enough that they're not looking at porn. They're looking at themselves. Um, is it associated with exhibitionism? I don't know the answer to that question, but I would think it's not because exhibitionists want to be seen by other people. Part of what they get off on is the shock value. Like, oh, what did I just see? And they kind of get off on that, unfortunately. This is not exhibitionism. This is, you know, uh, not that. And I can think of some things it might be related to emotionally, psychologically, you know, but I, I'm not a therapist for you or your family. But I will simply say that, and here's the thing I tell all the therapists, Tammy, you know this, therapists write me all the time, how do I do this? Where do I, how do I learn about fetishes? How do I learn? And my answer, I'm very, and I give them answers, but guess where I get them? While I'm talking to them, I go on Google, and I put, type it in. I would type in recovery from, what is this about? I would type it into YouTube. I would, you know, try to find, you know, you spouses, try to find information, find out everything you can about this. Um, as hard as it is to say, I bet there's a lot of resources out there to learn about it. From um, qualified people, because like there's yes. a lot of junk oh, well, out of there course. too. So, so yeah. But, but unqualified people wouldn't know how to spell that. Well, but there you I'm go. Just kidding. Okay. So we've got two more questions and we started a little bit late. So hang in there okay. with me. 
Okay, can it, it be difficult to get to help an essay who is in fantasy voyeurism and exhibitionism? Well, I think we kind of answer that question, which is voyeurism and exhibitionism are some of the hardest compulsive behaviors to stop. And so it, it's not difficult to help a sex addict if they're committed, if they're working on themselves. It, it would be difficult for a spouse to help an essay. By the way, I don't know if this is a partner or not, but yes. So something I worry about, and Tammy, I, you can correct me on this, but when spouses are asking about how does the other person figure this out? That worries me. You know, I do these consultations. They're two hours. I sit with couples and help them try to figure things out. And I know how this couple is doing because I say to the spouse, well, who made this phone call and set this up? I did. Well, who found the information about me and Rob and his work? I did. Well, who read the books? I did. Who listened to the podcast? I did. And that worries me when it's the spouse who has all this information, all this knowledge, and they are dragging the addict through the process. This is someone who should be able to say to you, you know, I'm struggling with, you know, I'm struggling with voyeurism and exhibitionism. And let me tell you the difficulties, the positive, what I need to do, who I need to see. You shouldn't have to figure out this out. They should come to you. Um, but if you really, really want to figure it out, there's a lot of lot of information online. And Tammy gave, and I gave you two really good resources for sexual offending behavior. And again, um, people may engage in offending behaviors in a compulsive manner. That doesn't mean they're a sex addict. If you said to me, someone is into voyeurism and exhibitionism, and they didn't know anything else, like they didn't look at porn, they didn't pick people up, they didn't hook up, they didn't, then I would, I don't know if they're a sex addict. What I know is they have a compulsive sexual offending problem. Um, I don't know whether it's addiction or not. We don't always call compulsive offending behaviors an addiction. So I would so need the, more information. Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. So the, the last question, I've watched you for two years and learned that I should never threaten, this is from a partner, threaten to leave unless I'm really going to do it. I've gotten stronger by writing myself to leave my PA uh, boyfriend, mm -hmm. the more we go through this repeating cycle, slips in his promises to change and doing recovery work. But what keeps me staying is that he says when he's made a mistake, he backpedals and thought he wanted to, he wanted to end our relationship during these slips, but then tells me he loves me and he just doesn't know what he wants, but he loves me and only wants to be with me forever. Um, we've been together since we were 19 years old when we were together for almost 20 years. I've spent half of my life with him and only know this life and I'm not the one they wanted to ever end the relationship. So I'm having a hard time listening to him and his regret mistakes and then trying to be supportive partner because I just feel like I've been dumped over and over again. How do I cope with these slips? Well, um, I think the words that other spouses would use is gaslighting and manipulation. There is no reason why someone who's struggling with recovery should then follow it by, but I really love you, but I'm not sure if I want to be with you, but I really care about you. And then when I slip it, it has nothing to do with you. You know, if this person is committed to change, they're committed to change. And if they're not committed to change, they're not committed to change. And that part has nothing to do with you. And whether he feels like he loves you one day or hates you the next day or wants to be with you, that has nothing to do with recovery. But what I do think is here is a lot of manipulation. And I think you're falling for it. I understand. I have spent, is it half my life? Um, I understand what it's like to spend 30 years or 20 years with someone and to have spent more time with them than you did your family of origin. I can't imagine at this point in my life what it would be like to not be with that person. But, you know, the question is, am I able to come to peace in these circumstances? Do they, does it drive me crazy? Am I, am I losing a focus on myself and what I need and want in order to, I mean, you, you know, this person, this is the dog, what is it? The tail's wagging the dog. You know, it's, he's going this way and you're following him and he's going this way and you're following him and you're wondering what your part is and he's manipulating you and whether he loves you or not. Um, these aren't mistakes. These are actions that are taken without enough support for change. And I do hear him say, and this whole, he made a mistake thing. So again, I hear a lot of manipulation. Like if I say it this way, I will confuse her or I will challenge her. And maybe she'll put her anger aside because after I, I told her it was just a mistake. And besides, I really love you. And what does it have to do with his struggle and what he is choosing to do about it? Um, so 
I think that you, again, I don't see anything about anything. It's that all he, lip service. It's all, I, he's saying, he's, make, he's making promises. He tells me he loves me. There is not. And here he's seeing a qualified professional. He's gone to our PA 101 work group. He's going to, you know, six, you know, a PA or you're PA. You're saying things he's not process. doing. Correct. Right. I, I don't read anything. It's just the lip service. So, so I'm going to be really like, it's going to sound harsh, but you know, 20 years from now, he can be doing the same thing. We hear this all the time. So, so uh, two years from now, are you okay with him continuing the cycle? You said, I've been listening to this stuff for two years. Great. You know, you're getting stronger. Great. It's not what his lips are saying. That's lying and gaslighting. What are his actions telling you? And if he is, you know, with this backpedaling, it's not even backpedaling. He, you know, he may go a period of time of abstinence. There is no recovery plan. There is no sobriety plan. I don't hear anything in what you've shared of here's all the work he's doing. We've got a treatment program. Be, be perfect. He's been doing this stuff for 20 plus years. You know, we can help. That would show a sign of commitment. That would show action. All of this other stuff is just pretty words. Um, I just wanted to add one thing, which is, yeah, I mean, your moods and your sense of self and your hope and your love are riding up and down based on what he is or isn't doing. And that has to happen for you. You have to find your own balance and peace. And by the way, I do want to say something about, I say not to leave. Um, you don't have to leave to sleep in separate bedrooms. You don't have to leave to tell someone to sleep on the couch. You don't have to leave to say, I don't want to see you come back in a week when you've got your shit together. Um, you don't, it doesn't have to be, I'm leaving forever and that's it. And you can take steps toward protecting yourself in various ways without it being the end. You know, this is not black and white, but it is about what you say is I'm having a hard time. Um, I'm trying to be supportive, but I'm being dumped all over again. How do, how do I cope with the slips? How, that's a question for you. You know, how do you want to cope with someone causing you pain? Um, you don't have to walk out on them, but you can certainly put them out for a while and at least don't give them the benefit of, of the good parts of living in the house with you. You know, they can eat alone. They can watch TV. You can go out. You can take care of yourself. You know, you don't have to go all the way to leaving in order to make yourself feel better and distance yourself from what feels like a lot of manipulation. And by the way, are you in a partner's group? Are you going to the trade partner's group? Are you, are you in therapy? What are you doing to support yourself? Because you are being victimized as you write this um, by someone who says they love you. And by the way, the last thing, I do believe that our partners love us. I do. I think that they are not able to sustain or hold on to that love because they are so broken. But interestingly, when we start to move even an inch or two away from them as partners, boy, are they, oh my God, what was I doing? And I, you know, but when we stay where we are and let them continue to walk all over us or convince us or gaslight us, they don't have any motivation for change. Um, I don't, I don't but, need to change if I can keep doing, I'm still going to act out and I still get you and I'm still going to, oh, sorry. 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 And, and, and I'll say one more thing because Tammy, boundaries are not to make him, you know, you kick him out, you set, they're not to change anything in him. Boundaries are to make yourself feel supported, feel like you're, to make sure you're not being dumped on over and over again, or you're not being right. It, boundaries to make sure you are safe and you're not losing your mind. It's not to make him do anything. And that's the piece about codependence. You know, you can love someone and care about them and understand why you were with them and still say, this isn't safe for me, you know, and that's, that's pro-dependent. Mm -hmm. You still love them, but you're not going to pull up with the crap. And that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, Tammy, I'm going to eat dinner. Is there anything else? I, me too, because it's an hour later for me now. So so thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Great question. So um, we'll be around. Coming back and yeah, there's lots of resources on our site. So thank you. Bye, Bye folks. Thanks, Tammy.